All right, so uh, this is definitely part of the beyond part of this conference. And um, I'd like to thank the organizers both for inviting me to speak here and also for running such a wonderful, stimulating, interesting conference. And perhaps since I'm the last speaker, it would be appropriate to applaud them for the great work that they've done. I'd also like to thank David. Um, many people have told stories. I have some stories, but I decided not to tell them. <laughs> I already told them once, and sometime I'll tell you about the consequences that I suffered as a result. <laughs> totally self-inflicted, though. David had nothing to do with it. Um, but I would just like to say that being at the, the example that's, that David set when I was at Princeton was really extremely influential on me at a very you know, formative time in my career. And I was not, you know, it's, not, it's impossible to copy the same energy, dedication, and you know, enthusiasm that he has for physics. But it's always, know, it's always good to know what you're trying to live up to. And um, you know, I remember many, many lunches at Princeton where David would, we would sit down and he'd say, did you see the paper by blah, blah, blah about this and that? And a few people had, but there would always be a very lively discussion every time anything important came out. And not just in particle theory, I mean, really very broad. So it made a huge influence on me. But I'd also like to blame David because, uh, <laughs> I mean, everybody said such nice things. <laughs> well, I, I'm actually not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna say anything negative. I'm just going to, I'm going to blame you in part for my talk because working on the heterotic string was a very influential time in my life. And we found all sorts of exceptional things, you know, the quadratic casimir of E8 had to vanish. There had to be two self-dual lattices or whatever, uh, the anomaly cancellation. But it was just really incredibly intricate how it all worked. And I think that, and probably the influence of my advisor, Pierre Ramond as well, gave me a certain you know, taste for exceptional exotic objects. And I've tried to not only do that, but I can't resist <laughs> the call of exotic special things in the hope that I'll be able to relive my youth at some point. All right, so talking about exotic things, um, here's, here, I got this off of some goofy web page, but you know, you can find all sorts of interesting things on the, on the internet. And, um, so one of the great accomplishments of 20th century mathematics is the classification of finite simple groups. You all know what a finite group is. A simple finite group is like a prime number. It's something that can't be de decomposed into smaller groups. And some of them you recognize. So this whole column here are what physicists would call ZP for P a prime, a cyclic group. Over here we have the uh, alternating groups, subgroups of the symmetric group consisting of even permutations. Um, these are also infinite columns and the whole swath of thing that most physicists never encounter. Groups of Lie type where you take basically Lie groups over finite fields. One example that people may have encountered is A1 of 7, sometimes known as SL2 of 7, which has order 168 and shows up as an automorphism group of a Riemann surface of genus 2 or 3, I think. Sorry, but most of these things you've never encountered, but they're there. And then there are 26 sporadic groups that don't fit into these infinite families and are really bizarre and exotic objects. And the most exotic of these is the monster, which has about 10 to the 54 elements. Uh, there's something called the baby monster. There are Fisher groups, the Thompson group, three Conway groups, Janko groups, Matthew groups, named after the various mathematicians that discover them. So um, it turns out, for reasons that I think we really don't understand, that for some of these groups, the best handle we have on them, the best way to understand many things about them, is through conformal field theory or things that seem to have something to do with conformal field theory or string theory compactifications. And that definitely seems to be true for the monster, the baby monster, the Thompson group, the three Conway groups, the Matthew groups, and well, I don't know whether it'll be true for the others or not. So here's kind of a menu of uh, moonshines that exist now. Um, this is supposed to be like going to a fancy restaurant where they just say chicken, but then they have a list of exotic ingredients that you've never heard of that accompany it. So monstrous moonshine involves the monster, the J function, genus zero, and this is a partial list of the people that have worked on it. 
Then there's something called Conway moonshine that involves the largest Conway sporadic group. Um, there's Matthew moonshine, which you've heard about and I'll remind you of. There's umbral moonshine, which I'll talk a little bit about, which involves Niemeyer lattice groups, mock modular forms. And I'm not sure it deserves a place on this list, but um, I wrote a paper recently with an undergraduate and then we're working with John Duncan on something called Thompson or skew holomorphic moonshine, which seems to tie together some of these other kinds of moonshine. So what is this all about? Well, I'm going to offer you kind of a tasting menu, just a small sip of each of these to say a few words about what's involved. And then at the end, I'm going to try to say why, what I think it's trying to tell us. Um, if I knew for sure what it was trying to tell us, I would be working on it rather than talking to you. But I think there are hints that um, these exotic structures that we're finding have, are trying to tell us something about physics. Some guy drinking moonshine out of a still. <laughs> What do you think it's a picture of? <laughs> you know that guy? <laughs> if I'd been really good at Photoshop, I would have put your face there too. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't... Does it... So, I first want to say one thing about what moonshine is not. Because I think sometimes in the physics literature, there's an impression that it just means a connection between a finite group and a modular object, some kind of modular form of some weight for some subgroup with a modular group. But it's really more than that because just finding such a connection, although it might have been strange in the past, is now completely trivial. Choose a lattice invariant under some finite group. It might be the hexagonal lattice if you're a honeybee. It might be you know, the E8 lattice if you're a string theorist. But you can find all sorts of lattices invariant under all sorts of exotic, interesting, finite groups. And you can construct a lattice vertex operator algebra based on gamma. That is, you can study string theory on RD mod gamma. And the partition function of that theory will be a modular form with an action of G. That's too easy. It's not very interesting. So what really deserves the, ner the name moonshine is something where there's some extra, I say, rigidity, although that was kind of a controversial term earlier. But um, rigidity here is a, is a mathematical rigidity usually connected to what are called genus zero subgroups, either of the modular group or sometimes of SL2R. I'll say what that means. And really means that there's some subtle encoding of the structure of the group that's acting in terms of subgroups of SL2R. And it's a structure which is manifest in slightly different ways in all the examples that I'll discuss and is not there in just a generic relationship between a modular form and a finite group. So probably everybody's heard about monstrous moonshine, but I'll just go through very quickly. Um, so in 1978, the suggestion that there might be a relationship between the monster sporadic group and modular forms based on this identification, where 196884 is the first kind of interesting coefficient of the modular J function, which is the unique, unique weight zero modular function with a simple pole at as you go up to the top of the fundamental domain, I tau goes to infinity. And um, the monster, because 196883 is the dimension of the smallest non-trivial representation of the monster. So this was so fantastic and so weird and so unlikely, it was called moonshine. And Thompson and others quickly followed that up with additional <laughs> observations like this. I think at the time, the monster was not actually known to exist and the dimensions of its repre irreducible representations has not been, had not been worked out. So I was talking to Dick Gross, the number theorist at Harvard a while ago, and he said that he remembered being at a number theory conference in California when one of the people at the conference got a letter from Thompson with these additional decompositions of coefficients of the J function into the monster, which he'd worked out by figuring out what the dimensions of the irreducible representations were. And he said this letter was passed around to the conference with great hilarity. Everybody viewed it as evidence that the finite group theorists had finally gone completely off the deep end. And <laughs> I mean, it just was ridiculous. But um, I think it was Thompson that suggested that one way of making sense of this would be to, or start to make sense of it, would be to say, take each coefficient and identify it with the representation of the monster that it suggests. 
So 196884 we would view as a direct sum of the first two, first two irreducible representations. The next guy is the sum of the first three. And you would then have a collection, infinite collection of vector spaces, one for each power of q to the n in that um, decomposition of the j function. And there would be some infinite dimensional set of vector spaces graded by the coefficient of q to the, uh, the, the n in the coefficient of q to the n. And this would give you what mathematicians call a monster module, a set of vector spaces with an action of the group on the vector spaces. So J of tau would then be the sum of the dimensions of these vector spaces, or you could say it's a trace over this infinite dimensional vector space of the identity times Q to the N, where N is just some, something that's N on, the, on a vector in, the, in V to N. And when we see something like this, an infinite Q expansion like, like this, we'd say, well, that looks like it might be a partition function of a conformal field theory. But of course, at the time that they were doing this, conformal field theory was not really understood. So Conway and Norton, um, building on this idea, computed what are now called the twined partition functions. Um, if you have some group element G in the monster and it acts on this vector space, you can compute the trace of G on that. This will depend only on the conjugacy class of G and M. And I think there are 192 conjugacy classes, so they managed to work those all out. And what they found was that these were all what are called Haupt modules of genus zero subgroups of SL2R. And this fact was later proved by Borchards using, as one of the ingredients in the proof, the no-ghost theorem of the bosonic string. Why find them of Well, because, as I'll say later, when we put boundary conditions on a conformal field theory in the torus, we can put boundary conditions in the time direction, which, and you can put boundary conditions in the space direction. And often they're both called twisted, but it's useful to distinguish them and say, I'm twining and twisting. And so, time twisted is twined. so time twisted is twined, space twisted is twisted. Just so that you can know what you're saying. If you just say twisted, then you have to clarify. So, um, a crucial ingredient in Borchardt's proof was a construction by Frankel, Lepowski, and Merman of this infinite dimensional vector space as the state space of a C equals 24 conformal field theory constructed as an asymmetric orbifold. Now, this genus zero that I mentioned means that the fundamental domain of SL2Z that we're all familiar with over there is topologically genus zero. That's kind of obvious because what you're supposed to do is identify these two boundaries, fold this up, and you get something that has kind of three cusps to it. And the J function takes that topologically genus zero thing and maps it nicely to the Riemann sphere. So these quantities Tg of tau, the twined versions of J, play a similar role for other subgroups. Um, there are all sorts of interesting subgroups. I'm not going to describe them in detail, but just as an example, there's a subgroup of SL2Z where you demand that C be equal to zero mod N, which often shows up in orbifold calculations. Um, and these groups are genus zero when N is one of these integers. And I think most of these show up as uh, these twined partition functions in the monster. There's even more, um, and here's the twisted and twined. If you're a conformal field theorist, it's natural to think that if you have a commuting pair of elements in the monster, you can put um, a commuting pair of boundary conditions on the torus, since pi one of the torus is z times z, and uh, therefore you can construct a twisted Hilbert space and compute the action of g on that twisted Hilbert space. Um, this was, things like this were first suggested by um, Norton, I believe, and then Lance Dixon, Paul Ginsberg, and I gave a kind of conformal field theory interpretation of that. And these also turn out to be genus zero Haupt modules. So this is known as generalized moonshine. It makes sense that you can compute these, but um, we don't know why they're genus zero. What actually is the definition of Haupt module? The Haupt module is the, I guess it's sort of the uniformizing function that maps you from the fundamental domain of the upper half plane mod that group to the Riemann sphere. So this shows you that something special happens when we compactify the bosonic string to two dimensions. You could also use this to compactify the heterotic string to two dimensions. And as such a compactification, it's an odd duck, um, to borrow Andy's phrase. 
because it's a theory that has no massless states. The partition function on the left starts as q to the minus 1 in the heterotic string that gets projected out. The next term is of order q. That's a massive state. So it's a theory that has an infinite spectrum of massive states, no massless states, including not even a dilaton. So it's a very curious theory. Now, as a string theorist, you might say, well, what about the superstring? And you can do a very similar construction, and this leads to, for moonshine to a different group. So a compactification of the superstring to two dimensions would be a C equals 12, N equals 1 superconformal field theory, because I have eight bosons and eight fermions. And um, there's a construction that involves starting with 24 fermions, that's C equals 12. There are, 24, there are SO24 currents, which are just the fermion bilinears, that commute with the Virasoro algebra. But if you do an orbital fold by psi goes to minus psi, that kills the massless states in the Schwartz sector. And you then have 2 to the 12 spin fields that take you to the possible Ramon sector ground states. Well, because you're twisting 24 fermions, those all have dimension 24 over 16, which is 3 halves. And there's a candidate n equals 1 super Virasoro algebra because you have a dimension, you have a lot of dimension 3 halves fields. So it's remarkable that there is a particular linear combination of the spin fields, I'll call it G, such that the OPEs of the stress tensor in G are those of the n equals 1 superconformal algebra. The zero mode of no current annihilates G. That means this choice of G breaks the continuous SO24 symmetry. There's no continuous symmetry that preserves the n equals 1 superconformal algebra. But it turns out there's a finite group. And the finite group is a double cover of Conway 1, which is a sporadic group found by Conway. And this double cover is the automorphism group of the Leech lattice, this 24-dimensional, even self-dual. Yes? Yeah. Right. Yeah. By choosing an n equals, by choosing the spin 3 halves part of the superconformal algebra, by choosing the fermionic part of the stress tensor. I'm not going to, well, yeah, if you want to say it that way. But I don't have to gauge it. I could just say there is a G of dimension 3 halves such that that and the stress tensor have the OPEs of the n equals 1 superconformal algebra. What operators commute with those? It turns out that none of the cur currents commute with, they obviously commute with T, but they don't commute with G or T sub F. Yeah, I know, but there's no singlet, there, there's no, con I know, but, but if you actually look at it in detail, there's no, the zero mode of no current annihilates G. And so that means at best you can have a finite subgroup of SO24 that's left. And that finite subgroup is this Conway group, which does have a 24-dimensional representation. So it's very bizarre, totally non-intuitive. And um, there's, you know, the Leech lattice didn't go into this construction at all. It's a remarkable fact, and it really involves n equals 1 superconformal structures. So it's not something that just involves the bosonic string. It's something that involves supersymmetry. And again, it was uh, recently shown by John Duncan and a a student, Matt Crane, that the twine partition functions are all genus zero help modules, again. So these are classic examples of moonshine that involve this rigidity due to genus zero functions, sporadic groups, and have explicit realizations in terms of conformal field theory. Um, the biggest mystery is why genus zero. Borchard's proof was kind of a computational proof. It was technically involved, but it didn't really explain why. And I'll try to say something about this a little bit later when I talk about possible connections to gravity. But it's really a mystery, exactly what's going on here. All right, so now let me move more towards the present. So in 2010, I think everybody knows that Aguchi, Aguri, and Tachikawa um, recognized a new moonshine phenomenon. And um, it is less well understood. Um, and there's no explicit conformal field theory construction behind it yet. So just to remind you, if you have a K3 surface, that defines a 4, comma 4 superconformal field theory with C equals 6. And there's the elliptic genus, which is an object which contains kind of an in infinite amount of topological information, basically involving the index of the Dirac operator coupled to various tensor products of the tangent bundle. 
It can be con computed either in space-time or as a trace in the Ramon-Ramon sector of the superconformal field theory. And it's unique basically because it's a Jacobi form of weight zero and index one, and there's only one of those. And they decomposed it into n equals four characters. The degeneracies of the massive representations of n equals four, when you do that, are encoded by a weight a half object known as a mock modular form, which I'll define for you. And this is what it is. And as they pointed out, 45, 231, 770 are all dimensions of irreducible representations of another sporadic group, the Matthew group M24. Of course, as you go up, they're not going to be just dimensions of your reps. They're going to be sums of dimensions, but it's still quite striking. Yeah. Yeah, there's, you can compute this to all orders. Yeah, yeah. But, but there, basically, yeah. So, I mean, you don't know that 45 isn't 45 times 1 until you get some new information. You'd, and at high orders, there are lots of ambiguities. So, as Hiroshi was saying, what you really need to do is to compute the twine guys. If you can compute the twine guys for all conjugacy classes of M24 and identify those with particular mock modular forms, that you have some ex expression for their Q expansion, then you can reconstruct the decomposition of any term. And that's now been done. But how do you insert the other You don't. You insert it. Well, what you knew is you try to insert it here. But if you insert it the wrong way, you won't get something that has some nice modular properties. So you determine. Yeah, so you have to check modularity. Now, of course, you're not checking exact modularity in the sense that we're used to it because this is really um, a mock modular form. Um, these things have a very colorful history, which I'm not going to tell you about. But their definition is that they are really the first of a pair of functions. So H is the mock modular form. G is called its shadow. So H is some holomorphic function in the upper half plane. It doesn't blow up faster than exponential. So if you think of going off to I infinity, that means it's just Q to some negative power. The shadow is a holomorphic cusp form of weight 2 minus k. And the sum of these two quantities, called the completion, transforms, well, the VV here means vector valued if you want to generalize it, transforms like a modular form of weight k, but it's not holomorphic. So you have a holomorphic function that's not modular. You have a non-holomorphic function, which, which is modular. And it's really, it's like the holomorphic anomaly. You have a tension between modularity and holomorphy. Um, so it's perhaps, so I can give you one example of what I mean by rigidity. It may sound kind of silly, but I don't think it's completely content free. Any ordinary modular form is a mock modular form with vanishing shadow. Now the J function has weight zero. Its shadow, if it had a shadow, would be weight two, but there aren't any weight two modular forms. Well, the fact that there aren't any weight two modular forms is not true for every subgroup of SL2Z. It's true for SL2Z, but it really depends on the fact that SL2Z is genus zero. So when you have genus zero, you have no weight two modular forms, which means there's no potential shadow, and you have honest modular forms. So in a way, the weight zero is enforcing a kind of rigidity on the modular forms, even in the ordinary case. So this has been hard to understand because no K3 surface has M24 symmetry that preserves space-time supersymmetry, that is a symplectic automorphism. No 4 comma 4 C equals 6 compact superconformal field theory has an action of M24 that preserves the N equals 4. But the groups which can act and preserve N equals 4 are all subgroups of the Conway group. So the most obvious explanation that there's some K3 surface with M24 symmetry is not the explanation because there is no such thing. And it turns out you can do both twisting and twining and for commuting pairs of G and H and M24, these all exist and have the expected mock modular properties. So it looks like a conformal field theory, but we don't, you know, it's behaving as if there's some path integral on the torus that defines these things, but we don't know what that is. So um, Miranda Cheng, John Duncan, and I got interested in this. And we were 
very interested in trying to generalize it. Now, as a string theorist, the most obvious thing is to say, well, if you get this magic out of K3, let's see what you get for some Calabi-Yau manifold. And it turns out that the elliptic genus of Calabi-Yau threefolds is kind of boring. They're all the same up to a constant. You can look at Calabi-Yau fourfolds or higher, but it turns out that it's hard to find anything that looks terribly interesting. So this appears to be one case where if you take a different point of view, that is, you think like a mathematician and just try to generalize the structure without worrying about the physics, you find something interesting. So in umbral moonshine, the K3 elliptic genus decomposition M24 story is, ge is generalized to a pairing of a set of Mach modular forms and a set of finite groups that I'm calling Niemeyer finite groups. These arise as follows, or one way of thinking about them is as follows. If you have a sphere packing, you can look at the holes that are as deep as possible, as far away from the centers of the spheres. They also form a lattice. The leech lattice, it turns out, has 23 different types of deep holes. And from those deep holes, you get 23 different lattices. Those 23 lattices are the Niemeyer lattices. They and the leech lattice are the 24 rank 24 even self-dual lattices. And the symmetries of these lattices are the groups of umbral moonshine. And the first example of this is um, the sporadic group M24. So in a little more detail, um, these Niemeyer lattices are specified by the root system. So the Leech lattice has no roots, no points of length squared 2. The Niemeyer lattices do, so if you would think about using them as a compactification of the bosonic string, they would give rise to a gauge group, which was determined by the roots of length squared 2. And the Niemeyer lattices have root systems which are rank 24 with ADE components with equal coxeter number. So from this data, it turns out you can construct not only the Niemeyer lattice, you can construct a finite group, which is the automorphism group of the lattice divided by the vial group generated by reflections in the roots. You can find a Mach modular form and its shadow, which exhibits moonshine for this group. You can construct a genus zero hope module. And you can find a Jacobi form, which is meromorphic, meaning it has poles in the uh, elliptic variable. And the first example of this, sort of, by some way of counting, has a root system of A1 to the 24th, and the group is M24. So this generalizes the mathematical structure found by Hiroshi and friends to 24 examples where you have a Mach modular form, a group, some kind of genus zero rigidity, and more structure that I'm not really telling you about. All right, so that's been a very quick survey, and I apologize for getting slightly too technical at the end. But I think the more interesting question is what, what do we do next? What is this trying to tell us? So. Um, I don't know for sure that any of these are, things are true, but they're, you know, they're what I'm listening to and trying to figure out what to do next. So first of all, it really seems like there should be explicit realizations of the Matthew moonshine, this umbral moonshine, that are either conformal field theories on the nose or closely related to conformal field theories. And my reasons for saying that are, first of all, this generalized moonshine also works for Matthew moonshine. That certainly sounds like you're computing some kind of partition function as a torus path integral. Mach modular forms, or things called slight generalizations called mixed Mach modular forms, appear in certain non-compact conformal field theories. So if you try to compute the elliptic genus of a non-compact conformal field theory, supersymmetry will tell you that the discrete spectrum cancels between fermions and bosons, well, what that really means is it gives you a holomorphic answer. But if there's a continuous spectrum, the um, density of fermions and bosons do not have to be equal in a supersymmetric theory. And so you have to integrate the density of fermions against the density of bosons, and that leads to a lack of holomorphy when you compute the elliptic genus. But you know the elliptic genus ought to be modular, so it turns out you either have it, it's either holomorphic and you just include the discrete spectrum, or it's modular but not holomorphic if you, if you include the complete spectrum. So that also smells like what's going on here. And um, John Duncan and I showed that one example of umber moonshine based on E8 cubed lattice 
has an explicit realization in terms of a vertex operator algebra. This is kind of a mathematical version of conformal field theory, but it's not as tightly constrained as conformal field theory. And our construction is not yet what I think any physicist would call a conformal field theory, but it involves some of the same ingredients. It basically involves a lattice, but one with indefinite signature, where you restrict a certain cones in the lattice so that you get a convergent theta function. So these all, to me, hint that we should be looking for some variant of a conformal field theory-like object. Monstrous moonshine, if we had listened to it very early on, was trying to tell us something similar. That is, the frankel lepowski berman construction was really the first example of a orbifold conformal field theory that has turned out to be an incredibly useful concept and I think it's likely that we'll learn something similar from umbral moonshine. We'll enlarge the space of CFT constructions that we understand, and that will be a useful thing to have. So this is more a mathematical comment, but I think there are likely to be manifestations of these large sporadic groups in the enumerative geometry of certain Calabi-Yau spaces. That's more or less inevitable, I think, if you, you know, there's some connection of M24 to K3, which we don't completely understand, there are some hints of connections of umbral moonshine to K3. And, well, if you take that and heterotic 2A duality, and you take K3 on the heterotic side, then you have some calabi -Yau on the type 2 side, and you're bound to have some kind of action for sporadic groups if you do things right. So this might not be that surprising to a string theorist, but it's likely to lead to some really surprising results to mathematicians who don't know what heterotic 2A duality means and don't, you know, don't have that as a tool. Um, I think it's likely that there are going to be some interesting connections between moonshine and 3D gravity. Um, Ed Witten famously suggested that pure gravity in ADS3 ADS should be dual to the monster CFT. I don't think that idea has really um, been fleshed out. I mean, it's, he proposed a whole set of extremal conformal field theories which don't seem to have the properties he wanted. I think for this particular case, it's sort of unknown whether this is true or not. But there's another, to me, powerful ind indication that there should be a connection. And that comes from, on the physics side, the work on these fairy tale expansions due to Dijkgraaf, Ferlinde, Moore, Maldacena, Manchot. And um, on the mathematical side, to what are called Rademacher series. So there are these series expansions for the J function, which were developed by Rademacher. And they can be reinterpreted as semi-classical expansions in ADS space. Um, and in, I mean, that has been used. So for example, there's a series of papers by Atish Dabalkar where they do localization in supergravity, basically reconstruct BPS state counting functions in terms of semi-classical sums over ADS3 geometries. And all of the coefficients of the known moonshine modular functions and Mach modular functions have Rademacher expansions. As a matter of fact, Frankel and Duncan, in the, in the case of monstrous moonshine, proved that the series were Rademacher summable if and, and only if they were the Haupt module for genus zero. So it seems to be saying that the thing that's special about genus zero is they have some kind of three-dimensional gravity interpretation. But it doesn't seem to be that quite standard three-dimensional gravity, but but there's nonetheless a very close connection mathematically. I think we should look for a manifestation of moonshine in BPS black hole counting problems. Um, that's kind of related to the last point, but I mean something slightly different here. So another way that Mach modular forms arise is in a very detailed analysis of the famous counting of quarter BPS states in n equals four theory. So that was famously conjectured to be 1 over phi 10, where phi 10 is the Siegel form, and then people said it couldn't be true, and eventually it turned out to be true, but you had to define it very carefully. It's something that is chamber dependent, and if you take that counting function and you expand it kind of in the M-theory limit, you find a series of Jacobi forms that are meromorphic. They have poles in the elliptic variable, due to the non-compactness of part of the moduli space. And DMZ showed that there's a standard way of decomposing 
those Jacobi forms into a mock part, and that that mock part is counting the degeneracy of single center black holes. So when you try to compare the microscopic entropy to the macroscopic entropy of a black hole, you have to worry because there can be, it could be that when you take the limit to go to supergravity, that the thing you're counting with fixed charges and mass actually corresponds to a double centered black hole. And you don't really want to be computing the entropy of that. You want to compute the entropy of a single center black hole. And it's this mock modular part that, pull, that singles out that singled center part. So exactly the same kind of meromorphic Jacobi forms are used in constructing the mock modular forms of umbral moonshine, except they have a single pole rather than a double pole. But mathematically, it's very similar, and much of what we used to actually do a lot of our constructions were based on extracting things out of this DMZ paper, which were based on doing black hole counting. So one uh, final thing, um, the objects, the mod modular and mock module objects that appear in moonshine are also characterized by what I would call modular forms of minimal exponential growth. And in the context of black hole counting, this would be some kind of minimal entropy black hole with given charges. So let me explain what I mean by that. There are all sorts of weight zero modular functions, um, but if they have a pole at infinity, and only at infinity, they're always a rational function of J. And there's a basis for those rational functions of J, where you have Q to the minus M plus of order Q, and here are the first few terms in that basis of functions. So you could have said, well, all right, this guy has moonshine, but why not some of these other guys? Well, one is a weight zero modular form, but it has coefficients that don't grow very fast. <coughs> If you have something that goes like Q to the minus M by the standard, um, you know, Hardy, Ramanujan, Cardi kind of formula, the coefficients of Q to the N grow like the exponent of 4 pi times the square root of MN. So if you want exponential growth, but with the smallest possible coefficient, you should pick out this function J. Here's another nice modular function, the theta function. Um, I think I learned from David when I was in Princeton that this was the um, trace of the time evolution operator for a particle on a circle, and you could derive the, the modular transformation property by comparing the path integral and the canonical calculations of this quantity. So this is also part of an infinite family of modular functions. Uh, they're modular functions on gamma naught four, but okay, fine. And Borchards and Zagier worked out a basis of functions that have the same modular transformation properties of this, but are allowed to have some poles. So here are the first few terms. There's just the theta function, the coefficients don't grow, here's the next guy. And again, this is the guy with minimal exponential growth. Well, it turns out the coefficients of this up to some multiple of this, which is like adding a multiple of one in J to con cancel the constant term, exhibits moonshine for the Thomson group. These, you might say 248 looks like E8, but it turns out these other numbers are sums of, dimension, of irreducible representations of the Thomson sporadic group. And Brandon Rehun and I developed the whole theory of twi twining these guys and showing that you've got modular behavior and blah, blah, blah. The same thing is true of the Jacobi forms that enter into umbral moonshine. If you demand minimal exponential growth, you get the guys that exhibit moonshine. It's, so what Moonshine is telling me is there's some kind of thing that's like gravity, or maybe it is gravity in some context we haven't quite figured out. And in that theory, there are some minimal entropy black holes that um, form representations of really interesting sporadic groups and are sort of building blocks for, for building bigger black holes. So. I feel fairly confident that moonshine is going to lead us to some beautiful new mathematics. That already seems to be happening. But I really think it's likely that it will teach us something interesting about quantum gravity, black hole physics, sporadic groups, and something which I have not tried to explain and won't. But a lot of the ingredients here which I haven't discussed involve some fairly subtle aspects of number theory. And I think it's been a dream for a long time that string theory eventually is going to involve number theory at some deep level.
There's also a feeling that we don't really have a clue what that means yet. <laughs> I think moonshine might provide some clues as to at least a hint as to what that framework might be. Because there are other ways of calculating the coefficients of many of these things that involve things like traces of singular moduli, which involves taking the J function, involving it at some particular, you know, evaluating a special point of tau that satisfies some quadratic equation. And there's a lot of rich number theory. Modular forms are basically what number theorists use. So it's a hint. It's a hint. I think it's going to be a long time until we figure out what it is. But I really, you know, I think in string theory we need some new directions. We need some new understanding of fundamental principles. And, you know, maybe this, maybe something that's so mysterious and not understood could be a hint of a, opening up some new area. So um, happy birthday, David. I hope you've had a good time here. And um, thank you for your attention. Would you go back? You had this JM where uh, exponential growth was enhanced by the of the Right. If there would be a string theory related to it, would, can you take the Hagedorn temperature to zero? Well, you, you can easily construct a. Uh, a I don't know about a, you can't do a string theory. I mean, this is C equals 24. So th this is C equals 24M. Well, it's kind of hard to use it, you know, for M greater than 1, construct it as a string theory background since it has C greater than 24. Okay. Yeah. Thank when you. you say that M24 is not a symmetry of the vertical algebra, it's, uh, it's hard to prove that something doesn't exist. But the, 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 do you mean that or just mean that K3 is not a different symmetry? Uh, so, um, it's some yeah, 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 no, 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 that's, yeah, the, 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 well, you see the, when you say it's a symmetry, you have to say what that means, I think. And if you just have a spectrum of, if you have, if you just have a spectrum, <laughs> <laughs> if you just have a spectrum of states, and the numbers are dimensions of representations, well, I mean, a symmetry ought to preserve something. So I would really say if it was a conformal field theory, it should, to be a symmetry would mean that it's a symmetry of the OPEs of the vertex operators. Um, but I, I, in, the, in the paper by, uh, I think it was Gabardiel, Volpato, and I'm mean, forgetting somebody, they really showed that there was no, that M24 could not act as a symmetry of the conformal field theory, not, not K3, just 4 comma 4 C equals 6 conformal field theory um, while preserving the N equals 4 superconformal algebra. For, for so CFTs. for compact CFTs. Now, Greg has been pushing me many times and other people because he says, well, okay, it's, so it's not a symmetry of the full conformal field theory. Maybe it's a symmetry of the algebra of BPS states. You know, we should just look at a subsector of the theory, um, and you should look at this algebra that we tried to define in a couple different ways. That turns out to be technically really, really hard to check, because at any point where you can solve K3 exactly, there are, ac there are extra states that cancel on the elliptic genus that are there in the spectrum. So 45 is really, you know, 48 minus 3. And you have to define some subspace, and it gets very, very hairy. So I don't think anybody has ruled that out. But it could be that there's, it's a symmetry, but if not of the full conformal field theory, but of some, some object that you extract from that. And then this, uh, this EAQ theory, what, what is the symmetry? So there, the symmetry is S3. It permutes the three copies of E8. A lot of the symmetries in Humble Moonshine are not very spectacular groups. I mean, one of them is M24. Sometimes it's S3. Sometimes it's Z2. You know, sometimes it's things like a Z2 extension of the Matthew group M12. So, you know, they're interesting, but they're not always that exotic. And if you didn't know what, what the pattern was, you would never find moonshine. I mean, if you're trying to find moonshine for S3, the, demand, the representations are big enough. You'd never be convinced. So you have to find some examples, then see there's a pattern, and then once you know the pattern, you can construct everything and see that it works. <laughs>